somebody dropped, abandoned this puppy, and it's a Great Dane mix. So this is a going to be a big dog. But but this guy adopted this dog. That's his family now. This is the dog that gives him protection, warmth, gives him unconditional love. I mean, it's it's this these two people, these two lost souls found each other. Hello, and welcome to Give a Dog a Bone. I'm Genevieve Frederick, the founder of Feeding Pets of the Homeless. Find out more about our mission and the animals we've helped. Hear the stories of insiders, volunteers, and leaders about why we do what we do and how you can make a difference. It's all here on Give a Dog a Bone. Welcome to this episode of Give a Dog a Bone. Today, I'd like to introduce Board Director Skylar Young. Skylar, welcome. Thank you. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and how long you've been on our board at Feeding Pets of the Homeless. Sure. So I started as a volunteer in 2016, and I helped at a couple of clinics in Carson. And shortly thereafter, I uh, joined the board. Currently, I'm based in Los Angeles. I work with immigrants, uh, mainly in asylum law. And I've been able to keep actively on the board ever since my move, which was very nice. So why did you want to get involved with our organization at Feeding Pets of the Homeless? So as a dog owner and lover myself, I really, really believe in the life-saving properties of, of pets. And in this instance, with unhoused persons, it's life-saving. And um, so I just truly believe in our mission. Great, great. I do too. What kind of dog do you have? He is a little mutt, a little scruffy terrier. Maybe they advertised him as a schnoodle, so now he's your poodle, but he's a mutt and I got him on the streets um, in Las Vegas in a Walmart parking lot. Wow. Yeah, and he's been my saving grace this whole pandemic. He's been my little buddy, my little companion. Oh, I know. They they give you so much comfort. They're non-judgmental. And I think think our audience understands that human-animal bond that these dogs are with their humans 24-7, just like we all have been during this pandemic. And so it, it just makes that bond even stronger when you're with them all the time. Um, I, I had two dogs up until a couple months ago. We had to put one of our dogs down. She was my very favorite dog of all the dogs that we've had oh. over the years. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you, it's kind of like children. You always have one favorite child. Mm. That's what they say. I try not to be that way, but <laughs> with pets, it's very easy to yeah. be attached to one over another. Oh, I'm sorry about that. That's, you know, the loss of a pet is very hard. It yeah. is. Oh, and when we have to put a pet down because our homeless people haven't found us in time and the animal is too injured or too ill and the doctor that's there, you know, they say this is this we can't help this pet. It is very very difficult. In fact, sometimes these people will say no and they will leave the clinic with their pet. Wow. And and we know that the pet is in pain right. and that it's suffering and this person cannot just let it go. So, you know, those are the heartbreaking cases mm-hmm. that we have. Skylar, I know that you've um you've helped us out here um up north in Nevada and but I also know that you have been helping at some wellness clinics in on Skid Row. Tell us about that and about the clinics. So for the uh, past six years, I've been helping out with a big event in Skid Row um, called Skid Row Carnival of Love. It's one of my favorite days of the whole year, Um, as well as giving um, necessities. It's it's a full full blown sort of party atmosphere. So we were giving um, food, clothing, 
Um, there's medical support, dental support, but there's also a carnival aspect of face painting, music, food, barbecue. It's just an amazing, uh, amazing atmosphere that we put on every year. A uh, c- couple years in, there were no vet services. And uh, working with POTH and being a board member, I thought it would be great if we could partner with a local vet and also bring vet services to this Skid Row event. So um, I've been working with the local uh, local LA vet, Dr. Nicole Weinstein of Arrow Dog and Cat Hospital every year. She brings her uh, vet techs and I bring a couple volunteers from POTH and we service about 20 to 30 pets every year um, with vaccines, nail trimming, deworming. And if they need um, a spay or neuter, we can also direct them uh, to contact us or any other kind of uh, life-saving things that their pet needs. I give them our information and they contact headquarters if they need more services. It's a great event. Yeah, it is, it is. Um, We, Um, sponsor those kinds of wellness clinics across the country. And um, obviously, because Skylar's on our board, we have sponsored um, the wellness clinics down at, um, on Skid Row for that. Um, Yeah, it's, it's, those kinds of events are so heartwarming because this is your chance to really connect with the people and their pets. And they're so thankful. Don't you find that true? Oh, it's wonderful. And we find we're there setting up, the carnival is setting up, and a lot of our past participants that we've serviced are lined up and they cannot wait to see their vet. Um, I, I've worked with the same vet and people just consider now Dr. Nicole their vet and they just can't wait to help their pets out and their pet's health. Um, being on the board sometimes with other nonprofits, it's not really an on the ground level position. You're, you've got oversight usually. Um, but I myself love to do both and I love to connect with, with who I, I'm, I'm servicing and helping. And, um, so it, it's just wonderful and they are very grateful and, um, just excited. Yeah. You know, we found that, um, a lot of the pets of the homeless that go through these wellness clinics, sometimes that first year that they are there, that's the first time that animal has ever been seen by a veterinarian. So, you know, it's, it's so important to get these vaccinations so that disease doesn't um, run rampant in that community. And right. that was one of the reasons that we decided to do this. Not only um, that if the animal at that clinic is too ill or injured, then the uh, doctor is um, instructed to give us uh, give that person our phone number so that we can turn it into an emergency case, which then we will get that person and that animal to the nearest hospital. But yeah, a lot of the doctors will tell you that these pets are very, very healthy. Yeah, they probably aren't getting you know the same dog food every day, and they're probably eating a hamburger every once in a while, but they're getting a lot of exercise. Most of them are very social because mm. they're around other dogs and people and noises from the street. And it's just uh, another whole realm of socialization for these pets. Uh, my my own pet, she's at home sleeping on my bed. She doesn't get, you know, <laughs> that, that many walks out there. Right. And, Yeah. So, you know, it's a different whole environment for these pets and it's a healthy one. Maybe just a person's gut reaction to seeing a homeless person with a pet is that they're selfish and um, that that pet's not getting taken care of and maybe just pandering and the the empathetic part of having a pet. And that's just not true. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that people go into homelessness a lot of the times with their pets. And they keep that pet because that's basically their child. Um, people don't get pets after becoming homeless. I mean, I'm sure there are cases that that happens, but in reality, they are um, keeping their companion with them as they transition into this horrible reality. But they have this non-judgmental companion by their side. Absolutely, I can I can relate to that. I was just uh, working with one of my case managers who 
um, was taking a case for a dog that had been in a dog fight. The gentleman, the, and he's a young man, has this dog. This dog was dropped off in the desert as a puppy. And he, at near where his tent and his, he built this little shack out in the middle of um, Lancaster, California. <clears throat> and it's very deserty out there. But anyway, somebody dropped, abandoned this puppy. And it's a Great Dane mix. So this is going to be a big dog. But, but this guy adopted this dog. This dog, you know, he now they are, that's his family now. This is the dog that gives him protection, warmth, gives him unconditional love. I mean, it's it's this these two people, these two lost souls found each other. And it was a great story. Unfortunately, the dog got in a dog fight and he was able to find us and we verified that he was truly homeless. And we got the dog um, into a vet. They took x-rays because the dog was limping, but it, there was no fracture, so it was okay. He had to have a few stitches. There was some ear um, lacerations because he was in a fight, but the doctor was able to give him some antibiotic, uh, some pain meds, and they had to sedate the dog so they could do the x-ray. But you know, anyway, we ended up um, spending quite a lot of money because we all know how expensive veterinarian care is. Anyway, but that is one other way that people that are homeless end up with these dogs. They they find each other. They are, they've been abandoned on the streets or in the desert or wherever, and they attract to each other. That's very sweet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, interesting job that we have here. Um, you've seen the people at on Skid Row. What do you think that their biggest need is for their pets? Well, right now, uh, it's pretty well known that L.A. has a very bad homeless pop, uh, population. And Skid Row is, if you just drive down Skid Row, I mean, it looks like ants. Just live, it, it's, it's horrible, the homeless population. A lot of people that have pets um, are not able to get uh, low income housing or transitional housing or even shelters because they have pets. And I do think that's one of the top um, issues that's concerning the homeless population who have pets. They will not go into housing if they cannot bring their pet in. And I know that we have our crate program that's helped with shelters. I don't know how that, you know, that doesn't seem like it would transition into low income housing that's more permanent. I don't know. See, it's this sort of a disconnect there with um, how we can help our uh, unhoused population and their pets actually get housing. The, the trouble with low income housing is that sometimes those waiting lists are years. And if you're homeless and you're on a waiting list and you know that you're on a waiting list and you're hoping that someday that you'll get into some kind of housing, um, in the meantime, you're you're out there without any support at all, and it's it breaks my heart. Right. We re we recently started working with the VA in a program called HUD Dash Vash V A S H, and that is a program where the Veterans Administration is trying to get chronically homeless off the streets, and by doing that, they are you know, it, to get into this program, a veteran has to um, have some problems that has prevented him from getting into uh, low income housing. If they have a pet, that's just another barrier that they have to jump over. Right. So what we've done, we've stepped up and said, if you have a veteran who has a dog or a cat that needs vaccinations before they can get into that housing, we will pay for that. That's wonderful. So they, have, yeah. they have to be within that program. And when they're in that program, they are assigned a case manager by the VA. And the VA, then they that case manager makes sure that they are getting medical treatment, physical or mental, any kind of um, addiction treatment. So they have to stay within that 
work with that case managers to stay in that program. As long as they're in that program, we will help that pet if it has, if it's ill or injured as well. That's wonderful. Yeah, it is. Is there a weight restriction on, on pets? Oh, I, I'm sure there is. I'm sure. I Just mean, another there's a hurdle, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. You know, having a pet, there's so many challenges because if you want to go look for a job, where are you going to leave your pet? In your right. car or if you're in a homeless shelter that has a crate, then you can leave the pet there and go take care of business. But so many of the homeless shelters across the country don't allow pets. So that, like you said, that's one of our programs that we're very happy uh, that we've been able to provide 252 crates to 12 different states and they're in homeless shelters within those states. I think one, I think homeless shelters are realizing that there's a population that are not coming to them to get help because they don't allow pets. And right. if they can open those doors and those crates that we ship are metal, they clean up good, they're collapsible for easy storage. So they can be used over and if they be, come the property of that homeless shelter. So our hope is that, you know, more pets will be allowed. The people will be able to start working with a uh, social worker to get them into more permanent housing. So, yeah. Do you find the shelters that had the crates, are they requesting more crates? Yeah. Yes, yes. Because they see- Good to hear, how, right. Yeah, they see how good it is. Um, what happens a lot of times in these homeless shelters, if they're um, in a situation where there's a room with two beds and then two homeless people can be in that room, and then there's a dog in that room with a crate, that dog starts getting attached to that other human as well. And it just makes for a, a, a unit that they depend on each other. And it, it's it's we've heard great stories about the uh, outcome of having crates and shelters. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a good stepping stone to finally get housing. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we can't solve all the problems that are out there, but we have this little niche where we're trying to do exactly. what we can. Yeah. And, and because you're on the board, I appreciate your um, advice and, Whenever we have some kind of a, a legal um, issue, I could say that um, you're right there to give us suggestions, and I appreciate your help. Also, um, Skyler and all of our board members uh, support us financially as well because they they believe in what we're doing. So that that commitment is um, just awesome. So anyway. Do you have anything you want to add, Skylar, about our nonprofit or our programs? Or I've just enjoyed the ride. I, every year, I, um, I'm glad I was able to stay on the board, like I mentioned before. I, I'm honored to serve with you, and I love what we do. And I'm, I'm, yeah, I can't wait until we can start putting on more events in a COVID-conscious way and serving the community like we have been. Yeah, yeah. The, on Saturday, um, our staff and one of our doctors went up to St. Vincent's uh, Catholic Charities. They have a dining room and a, a food bank. And the doctors that were there, and, and we sent uh, some of our staff up there and volunteers as well. They saw, I believe, about 75 dogs and cats in a very short amount of time. That's incredible. Yeah. 75, wow. A couple of those animals needed um, emergency care. So they were, those homeless people were able to talk to our executive director who was there that day. And, and so those dogs are being taken care of this week. Um, we've got some others lined up that I don't have the exact dates and the cities um, on the books quite yet, but we have opened that back up and all of our doctors know that we're, we're, we're sponsoring them back again. Business. Yeah. Yeah. And by sponsoring, I mean, we pay for the hard costs. 
the vaccinations, the syringes, the gloves, what other, you know, little um, medical supplies they would like to bring with them because they go where the hom homeless are congregating. So it's kind of a off site from their hospital to do these wellness clinics. And, um, and because of that, I can say that in those wellness clinics, we have vaccinated over 16,000 pets since we started sponsoring these clinics. That's a lot of pets that are now being treated. Some of them are repeat customers, just like you said. And it's funny because when we do them, um, sometimes the doctors will remember the pet, but not the person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially well, if their pet's so cute, how can you forget? <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Well, that's about all the time we have for today. And I thank you, Skylar, for the wonderful job you do to advise us and to be on our board of directors. And again, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. All right. You've been listening to Give a Dog a Bone brought to you by Feeding Pets of the Homeless. If you've enjoyed the show, help us by leaving us a five-star review. It really helps new listeners find the show. If you'd like to connect with us, you can find us on social media and the web at petsofthehomeless.org. I've been your host, Genevieve. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>